Hello, I'm Roger Hemphill from the Aircraft Performance Group and I'll be narrating a presentation addressing aircraft performance and runway analysis. But before I begin this presentation, let me ask you a question. Are you ready for takeoff? Is your takeoff overweight? Or possibly, are you leaving payload behind? Are you using an incorrect runway length for your field length calculation? Well, the good news is a runway analysis may be what you need. Let's begin the presentation by addressing what is a runway analysis. A runway analysis is a calculation to determine takeoff and landing weights that uses two key elements. The first being AFM performance data. The second being runway and obstacle data. When the aircraft performance and a complete runway and obstacle data set are used, a runway analysis can be prepared to determine these weights. Let's take a look at the AFM performance data requirements. AFM performance data is required by the airworthiness standards. Part 25 addresses corporate and transport type aircraft and FAR Part 23 other aircraft. The flight test section defines the specific performance requirements that must be met. And data is collected during the flight test phase of certification. Looking at the performance data, aircraft performance must be demonstrated and collected. During the takeoff profile, takeoff speeds, takeoff run, takeoff distance, accelerate stop distance, and all segments of the takeoff flight path must be demonstrated and that data collected. Likewise, for the landing profile, landing distance, landing climb with all engines operating, and approach climb with one engine inoperative must be demonstrated and that data collected. Looking at the takeoff profile, it's broken into two elements, the first being the takeoff distance and the second being the takeoff flight path. We see that the takeoff distance starts at brake release with all engines operating at takeoff thrust, allowing the aircraft to accelerate to V engine failure where the critical engine has failed. The aircraft continues then accelerating through V1, VR, V liftoff, and climbs at V2 speed to 35 feet. It's during this phase of the flight test that the accelerate stop, the accelerate go, and the all-engine capability of the aircraft is measured. This data is then used to formulate the field length charts or the field length graphs contained in the AFM. Next we have the takeoff flight path which is broken into four segments. The first, second, third, and final segments. Looking at the first segment which picks up at the 35 foot point, we see that the first segment continues through the gear retraction point. We then begin the second segment at gear retraction and terminate the second segment at level off height. The level off acceleration height is a minimum of 400 feet which is specified in the FARs. Manufacturers may use 400 foot as the sole altitude for accelerating during the third segment or may provide a range of altitudes from 400 foot and above. It should be noted that during the first and second segments, that is from 35 feet to the level off point, the aircraft is flown as close as practical to V2 speed using takeoff thrust and that the slats and flaps remain in the takeoff configuration. Upon reaching the level off height, the third segment begins. During the third segment, the aircraft is flown in level flight with the purpose of accelerating from V2 speed to climb speed, allowing for the slats and the flaps to be retracted. There is one constraint, that is, that the third segment must be completed within the time limitation for operating with takeoff thrust. Most aircraft have a limitation of five minutes, however there are some that utilize ten minutes. That is to say, the time constraint begins at brake release and 
must be completed by the end of the third segment. Once the aircraft is in clean configuration, airspeed established at final climb speed, and the thrust at max continuous, we begin the final segment. The final segment continues to 1500 feet. That's an FAR requirement. However, APG uses a distance of 30 miles from the departure end of the runway for straight outs or for a departure procedure, either a holding pattern where the aircraft can be climbed to a minimum safe altitude or completion of the departure procedure. Let us now look at the takeoff flight path as a whole. Data was collected from the first, second, third, and final segments of flight that represents the actual performance of the aircraft with one engine inoperative. That flight path, illustrated in red on this slide, is labeled gross gradient. The gross gradient flight path must be degraded to a net value before it can be used in a flight manual. That is, the gross gradient data is reduced by a gradient reduction factor to a net value and then used within the flight manual. The amount of gradient reduction is determined by the number of engines. A two-engine aircraft uses a 0.8% reduction factor, a three-engine aircraft uses a 0.9%, and a four-engine uses a 1%. The important thing to remember is that the actual aircraft performance is degraded to a net value, and it is the net value that is used within the flight manual and used by a runway analysis program in determining takeoff weights. As the certification process comes to a close, the draft AFM is finalized and signed off at the time of certification. The AFM is an operator's manual. Its contents are fairly standard and include limitations, normal procedures, abnormal and emergency procedures, the performance data we've talked about thus far, and supplementary information. At this point, the aircraft has been certified and the AFM has been signed off. But what authority or what regulation mandates we abide by the contents of the AFM? For U.S. operators, the FARs specify those requirements. Regardless of what part of the FAR one operates the aircraft under, the FARs state we need to operate the aircraft in accordance with the AFM. When looking specifically at takeoff and landing limitations, the FARs say we need to account for environmental conditions, runway length and slope, and use of clearway and stopway. For those operating under FAR Part 91.605 addresses takeoff considerations, airport elevation, temperature, and wind need be accounted for along with field length requirements and use of clearway and stopway. In addition, for those operating as a fractional, they may use the 80% landing rule. That is, given a 10,000 foot runway, they may use 80% or 8,000 feet of it to determine max landing weight. Moving to part 135.379 addresses takeoff limitations and for those operating under eligible on demand who have applied for and received the op spec under point 385 Foxtrot they may use the 80 percent rule just like the fractional operator. Well, what does Part 135 say with regards to takeoff? It says we need comply with all Part 91 requirements, plus we introduce for the first time a vertical clearance requirement over obstacles, as well as a horizontal clearance requirement. It should be noted at this point that the requirements of Part 135 are identical to those of Part 121. That is to say, major airlines need comply with the same regulations that those operating a corporate jet under Part 135 need consider. Before we discuss the vertical clearance requirements of FAR Part 135, let's take a brief review of gradient terminology previously discussed. Gross gradient is the actual performance of the aircraft while operating with one engine and operative. Net gradient 
is gross gradient data degraded by a percentage factor to a net value. The net gradient data is the data that is presented in the AFM and it is the same data that is used in a runway analysis program in determining obstacle clearance and climb capability. The term net gradient is used within part 135 in describing vertical clearance where the FAR states the net gradient must clear all obstructions by at least 35 feet. In more simple terms, what that means, for a departure where there will be hundreds of obstacles that one may consider, one particular obstacle, the limiting obstacle, will in fact be cleared by 35 feet, whereas all remaining obstacles will be cleared by values greater than that. Graphically, we can show that by placing the limiting obstacle in the second segment and showing that it will be cleared by 35 feet, whereas all remaining obstacles will be cleared by greater than 35 feet. Similarly, if we put that obstacle in the third segment, it would be cleared by 35 feet and all other obstacles by a value greater than 35 feet. Likewise, if the limiting obstacle were placed in the final segment, it would be cleared by 35 feet and all remaining by values greater than that. This may bring to point a question. If net gradient data is being used to clear the controlling or limiting obstacle, how high will the actual aircraft be above that same obstacle? Well, let's take a look at two hypothetical obstacles that I've made to demonstrate increasing vertical clearance. I placed one limiting obstacle at one nautical mile and a second at 10 nautical miles from the runway. Using a two engine aircraft, we remember that the degradation factor from gross to net was 0.8%. So clearing the first obstacle, the aircraft will be 35 feet above it plus 0 .008 times one nautical mile, or approximately 84 feet. To show that this clearance is increasing, when we look at the next obstacle at 10 miles, the clearance now goes from 83 feet to over 523 feet. The point to remember is that a rule of thumb for a two-engine aircraft is you will clear the controlling or limiting obstacle by 35 feet plus 50 feet for each nautical mile away from the airport. Because a three-engine aircraft has a slightly different reduction factor, its rule of thumb is 35 feet plus 55 feet for each nautical mile. Let's now take a look at the horizontal clearance requirements of Part 135. In effect, Part 135 defines a corridor around the flight path and requires that we consider all obstacles contained within and that we clear these obstacles by the vertical clearance requirements we have just addressed. Let's take a look at a graphic of this corridor. The corridor starts at the departure end of the runway at a half width of 200 feet and expands to 300 feet at the airfield boundary. The 600 foot wide corridor is maintained until completion of the takeoff flight path. Realize that this flight path was defined more than 50 years ago and has been considered by many to be far too narrow. As a result, approximately 15 years ago, the FAA assembled a panel of industry experts with the objective to provide information for determining safe clearance from obstacles for the actual flight path and to consider the factors which may cause divergence of the actual flight path from the intended flight path. The result? A redefined obstacle corridor. This panel drafted an advisory circular redefining the obstacle corridor which has stood in effect for more than 14 years. Last year, the final version of this advisory circular, AC 120-91 was issued with the shape as you see here. The corridor starts the same at 200 feet half width, expanding to 300 feet at the airfield boundary. However, it begins expansion at a specified rate out to a full width of 4,000 feet. These are the requirements specified in the advisory circular for a straight out procedure. If a turning procedure or a departure procedure is required, the rate of expansion is doubled and the width is increased from 4,000 to 6,000 feet.
The definition of this corridor falls in line with the current JARops defined corridor that has been in effect for a number of years. I believe that all major airlines use this advisory circular as well as most runway analysis providers providing services to US airlines. Here's a comparison of the FAR versus advisory circular corridors. Now that we've looked at a number of points, let's do a summary. FAR requirements specify the requirements for how an aircraft is to be operated through the AFM. The FARs define the obstacle corridor and shape supplemented by the advisory circular. The FARs define the obstacle clearance requirements as well. And most importantly, the FARs require that all flight path considerations be for one engine and operative and that the engine fails at V1. That is to say, all runway analyses take into account the critical engine failing at V1 and continuing the flight path with one engine and operative. Now let's take a look at some of the runway and obstacle data sources. The first source of runway and obstacle data that we'll list is the obstacle chart, or OC chart. This chart is produced by the U.S. government for airports operated within the United States and its territories. The chart is updated periodically and contains information not only on runways, but obstacles surrounding the airport. I'll show a snippet of one of these charts in a subsequent slide. A second source of data is the FAA Digital Obstacle File, or DOF. The DOF, issued every 56 days, contains approximately 200,000 obstacles that lie within the FAA area of jurisdiction. A third source of data is the Aeronautical Information Publication, or AIP. The AIP is produced by each ICAO member country and contains a section regarding airports. Within this section, we will find charts that are very similar to the OC chart produced in the United States. A fourth source of data is the Digital Terrain Model, or DEM. The Digital Terrain Model is nothing but a digital model of the Earth with elevation points spaced every 30 meters around the surface of the Earth. These are just some of the types of data that we maintain in our runway and obstacle database. Looking more closely at the OC chart, we see in one of the views displayed on the chart, and this one being an overhead, the orientation of the runways and taxiways and the obstacles surrounding the airport. This information, along with profile and overhead views of each runway and its extended center line, defines the obstacles that are surrounding a given airport. The obstacle information and runway information that we've discussed to this point are just some of the sources. There are many others that constitute the database that are used in doing a runway analysis. Once the aircraft performance is collected and put into our performance program and the airport and runway information is inserted in the database, we're able to compute or calculate a runway analysis. The runway analysis calculation determines the following limit weights. Field length limits, brake energy limit, tire speed limit, minimum control speed limit, obstacle limit, takeoff thrust time limit, and climb limit or watt limit weights. When each of these has been calculated for a given runway, the most restrictive is selected and becomes the performance limit weight. Now let's take a look at one component used to calculate field length limit weights, and that's declared distances. Though the term declared distances may be new to most U.S. pilots, its use within the ICAO community has been used for decades. Let's take a look at the components of declared distances and their definitions. Takeoff run available, or TORA, 
is the runway length available for ground run during takeoff. Takeoff distance available, or TOTA, is takeoff run plus clearway. Accelerate stop distance available, or ASDA, is takeoff run available plus stopway. Landing distance available, or LDA, is the runway length available for landing. These four terms are used worldwide to define the characteristics of a runway. Let's see how a runway analysis uses these values. TOTA, which is the takeoff run plus clearway, is used in the determination of accelerate go to 35 feet. That maneuver must be completed in a distance equal to or less than TOTA. In addition, the all engines climb to 35 feet must be completed in a distance TOTA divided by 1.15. ASDA, we remember, is takeoff run available plus stopway. It is used in the determination of accelerate stop, which must be completed in a distance equal to or less than ASDA. Lastly, LDA is used in determining landing. The aircraft must be able to stop within 60% for FAR Part 135, the exception being those aircraft that have qualified for the OPSPEC for eligible on demand can use 80% of the available landing distance. I'd like to take a moment and address the terms balanced and unbalanced in that we will be using them in a non-traditional fashion. Traditionally, the term balance refers to the instance where the accelerate stop distance is equal to the accelerate go distance. In other words, they're balanced. When referring to our, our runway analyses, we will use the term unbalanced for the runway analysis that utilizes clearway and or stopway. That is to say, the accelerate go weight is calculated using clear weight and the accelerate stop weight takes into account stop weight. Both of those distances would be different and the weights consequently different. It's an unbalanced situation. The term balanced is used for a runway analysis that uses one and that is the shortest value most often Torah to determine the takeoff weight. The aircraft manufacturer establishes which method will be used, either balanced or unbalanced. As a note, most corporate aircraft used the balanced approach and do not take credit for clearway or stopway. This brings us to our next slide. Are you ready for takeoff? Are you using an incorrect runway length for your field length calculation? Let's take a look. What is your source of data for runway length information? Is it Jepson or the NOS airport charts? Or is it the FMS database? If it is, you could be calculating incorrect field length limit weights. This is due to the fact that the FAA is no longer issuing waivers for runway end safety areas, known as RESA. As a result, some airports are having to utilize an ASDA, which is less than TORA. That's saying the accelerate stop distance available is less than the takeoff run available. Jepson, NOS, and FMS databases do not publish these ASDA values. Consequently, using the longer TORA value will generate an incorrect field length limit weight. Let's look at an example. 
An NOS chart of Naples Municipal shows runway 0523 as being 5,290 feet in length and runway 1432 as being 5,000 feet in length. In addition, shown to the right, are the landing distances available due to the displaced thresholds. In a similar fashion, the Jepson chart for Naples shows the runways with the same lengths and in an additional runway information grid below show the usable lengths for landing with an explanation as well as showing in the depicted runway diagram above the displaced thresholds with a white bar. In addition, the usable length for takeoff is shown as 5,000 feet for runway 523, even though the graphic shows a length of 5290. The question now comes, that's okay as long as you use the 5,000 foot value, as opposed to the 5,290 foot. However, there are other concerns in that there is other information not shown on either of these charts which is required in order to complete a runway analysis. That document is the Airport Facility Directory. It contains the runway declared distance information for the appropriate runways showing the TORA, TOTA, ASDA, and LDA values. Under the Runway Declared Distance Information section, all of the runways at Naples are listed with their respective declared distances. Let's take a look at the landing distances presented in the Airport Facility Directory with that presented on a Jepson Airport page. We can quickly see that the runway lengths agree for all four directions. However, when we move to the accelerate stop distance available as displayed on the Airport Facility Directory, there is no comparable runway length displayed on the Jepson Airport page. Nor does the airfield diagram show anything other than the pavement length of 5,000 feet. If one were to use the 5,000 foot value versus the correct accelerate stop distance available as displayed in the Airport Facility Directory, there's the potential for an excessive weight takeoff. Let's take a look at that effect. In this comparison, we will use 5,000 feet versus the ASDA value of 4,550 feet for runway 14 at Naples. We'll use a Lear 60 and a Citation 10. Using the greater distance of 5,000 feet, which would be displayed on a Jepson and NOS chart or be contained in the FMS database, the takeoff weight for a Lear 60 would be 1,100 pounds overweight, whereas for a Citation 10, it would be 1,700 pounds overweight. Back to our original question, what is your source of data for runway length information? Is it Jepson or NOS airport charts? Or is it the FMS database? If it is, you could be calculating incorrect field length limit weights. Using a runway analysis avoids this problem. The database that APG uses uses a data source from the FAA which contains the correct declared distances for runways that do have as the limits that are shorter than TORA. Next let's look at TERPS. What does TERPS mean? Well TERPS is an acronym that stands for the U.S. Standard for Terminal Instrument Procedures otherwise known as FAA Handbook 8260.3b. What about TERPS? What does it stand for? What is it designed for? Looking at Volume 1, the purpose of TERPS is TERPS are criteria to formulate, review, approve, and publish procedures for instrument approach and departure of aircraft to and from civil and military airports. In summary, TERPS is criteria for designing instrument approach and departure procedures.
TERPS is not intended to comply with FAR takeoff or landing limitations. And most important, all TERPS procedures are based upon normal all engine operations. Looking specifically at TERPS departures or DPs, we can say that DPs are for normal all engine operations and that a DP may require a minimum climb gradient due to ATC or altitude crossing constraints, noise abatement, or terrain or obstructions, and that there is no requirement to specify a gradient for close-in obstacles. How are these minimum climb gradients displayed? Here is one example of how a minimum climb gradient at Minneapolis-St. Paul is displayed whereas it possibly, as shown here in Atlanta, can be included as part of a note on the airfield diagram page. How does TERPS generate a minimum climb gradient? Well, it starts with the initial climb area that TERPS defines starting at the end of the runway, 500 feet either side of centerline and expanding outward. Typically, the initial climb area ends at three nautical miles from the end of the runway, however it can be as short as 2 or as much as 10 miles from the runway. From this initial climb area, which is wider than the corridor that the FAA or the advisory circular or the jar ops corridor from the runway. The obstacle creating the highest gradient will be used in determining if a minimum climb gradient is necessary. If the highest obstacle creates a gradient equal to or less than 3.3 percent, no gradient need be specified. However, if the obstacle creates a gradient greater than 3.3 percent, a minimum climb gradient must be specified. There are special considerations, however, when looking at obstacles that are close to the runway. Close-in obstacles are defined as those lying within three statute miles from the departure end of the runway, and for those generating a gradient greater than 3.3 percent, TERPS requires that a note be published, and in addition, that standard takeoff minimums with a minimum climb gradient be published, a ceiling and visibility requirement be published, and or a text or graphic route be illustrated to avoid the obstacle. However, for obstacles lying within one mile of the departure end of the runway, TERPS modifies these criteria. Where low close-in obstacles result in a climb to equal to or less than 200 feet above the departure end of the runway, only the first note applies. More simply stated, for obstacles lying within one mile of the runway that are 200 foot or less in height, TERPS requires that only a note be published. Let's now take a look at a graphic comparing a runway analysis and TERPS approach to clearing a close-in obstacle. Remember that a runway analysis considers all obstacles contained in the takeoff flight path. A APG runway analysis considers obstacles starting at the departure end of the runway out to a point 30 miles from takeoff. Regardless of where the limiting obstacle is located, a net gradient will be used to determine a weight that will clear that obstacle by 35 feet. For the case where we have an obstacle within one mile of the runway that is 200 foot or less in height, a weight will be determined that will safely clear that obstacle by 35 feet. In that case, however, TERPS will not publish a minimum climb gradient. If one were to use a 3.3 percent gradient using second segment climb performance, one engine and operative, to determine a weight that will meet that gradient, this point is highlighted in a flight standard statement included in Advisory Circular 120-91. Compliance with TERP's all engines operating climb gradient requirements does not necessarily assure that one engine and operative obstacle clearance requirements are met. In summary, TERPS gradients will not assure clearing close-in obstructions, 
Terps gradients can reduce takeoff weight significantly and unnecessarily and using Terps alone does not comply with FAR 135-379 takeoff limitation requirements. On the other hand, runway analyses comply with FAR 135, 121, and 91. They utilize current airport and obstacle data in combination with approved AFM performance data for meeting field length limitations, climb limitations, and obstacle clearance requirements. In short, a runway analysis is a key component of a best practices checklist. Back to our question, are you ready for takeoff? Is your takeoff overweight? Do you use a gradient calculator? Well, if you do, your takeoff may be overweight. Using TERPS gradients alone to determine takeoff weight does not assure clearing close in obstacles. We've discussed that, now let's show two examples. First, we'll choose Manhattan, Kansas and compare a TERPS derived takeoff weight meeting a 3.3% gradient versus a runway analysis weight determined using the obstacle clearance criteria of Advisory Circular 120-91. Looking at runway 3 and selecting a Citation 10 and a Challenger 604, we can see the weights derived using a TERPS 3.3% gradient and next to it the runway analysis derived weights using the obstacle clearance requirements outlined in Advisory Circular 120-91. In the case of the Citation 10, we can see that the takeoff weight using TERPS is 700 pounds overweight. For a Challenger 604, that weight difference is 1,700 pounds. In our second choice, let's look at Fulton County Airport in Atlanta and do a similar comparison of a TERPS gradient uh, derived weight versus an advisory circular derived weight following the obstacle departure procedure depicted for runway 8. In looking at uh, the TERPS derived weights for a Hawker 850 XP, we can see that the takeoff weight using TERPS is 300 pounds overweight, and in the case of a Global Express, more than 2,400 pounds overweight. Our question regarding payload, are you leaving payload behind, or are you making unwarranted tech stops? Do you know how to safely and legally increase payload? Well, using a runway analysis or a runway analysis in conjunction with an engine out departure procedure may increase your allowable takeoff weight. Let's take a look at Aspen, Colorado, departing runway 33, and compare a TERPS derived takeoff weight with a runway analysis derived takeoff weight following the guidance in Advisory Circular 120-91. TERP specifies a gradient of 7.6, whereas the runway analysis will follow the footprint of the lens departure procedure. We'll compare a Lear 45 with a Falcon 2000. Looking at the Lear 45 weights, we can see that TERPS restricts the takeoff weight for the Lear 45 by 4,500 pounds. For the Falcon 2000, it's over 7,000 pounds. Looking at San Diego, departing to the east on runway 9, we again use the Falcon 2000 and the Lear 45. We can see that the Falcon 2000 is restricted by more than 10,000 pounds and the Lear 45 by 5,500 pounds. As our last example, let's look at Eagle, runway 25. The TERPS gradient is 12.3% and the runway analysis follows the gypsum departure procedure. Comparing a G550 and a Challenger 604, we can see that the G550 is restricted by more than 12,000 pounds and the Challenger 604 by more than 10,000 pounds. The last three slides illustrate examples where obstacles lie within the TERPS initial climb area but are far outside the advisory circular obstacle corridor. And in addition, because of the unusually high gradient, uh, 
attempting to match these gradients with engine out performance will only yield takeoff weights that are unnecessarily restricted. In addition, in the case of San Diego Runway 9, we have seen that an engine out departure procedure can increase payload and takeoff weight. Let's take a look at how engine out procedures are generated. Engine out departure procedures can increase takeoff weight. APG utilizes a computerized procedures generator as a graphical tool to display terrain, obstacles, navigation aids, etc. in an effort to develop a turn procedure which will avoid compromising obstructions while complying with FAR 135 and 121, with the goal being increased takeoff weight. APG utilizes the following selection criteria. If there is an obstacle departure procedure for the runway, we will attempt to use it first. If not, we will use a SID or departure procedure if they are published. Lastly, we will use a missed approach procedure, or if the weight is still not satisfactory, we will only then generate a tailored engine out departure procedure. In developing, we have the following criteria. The engine out procedure that we develop is based on one engine and operative operations. We will follow the FAR and advisory circular defined vertical and horizontal obstacle clearance requirements. We recognize that an emergency situation takes precedence over noise abatement, air traffic, SID and departure procedures, or other normal operations. Referring to flight standard statement contained in Advisory Circular 120-91, highlighted, an engine failure during takeoff is a non-normal condition and therefore takes precedence over noise abatement, air traffic, SIDS, departure procedures, and other normal operating considerations. Let's now look at an example of a published FAA obstacle departure procedure and how APG presents this information to the pilot. Looking at Atlanta, Georgia, DeKalb Peachtree, we see at the bottom of the airport information page a list of obstacle departure procedures. Looking specifically at runway 20 left, the instructions are to climb on a heading of 150 to 3100 feet before proceeding on course. APG will re prepare the analysis using this flight track and then present a textual description of the procedure to the crew member. Note that runway 20 left now has a suffix of DP. The suffix DP denotes that this is not a straight out and in fact an engine out departure procedure. Also note that the textual description is essentially the published FAA departure procedure. Let's look at another departure procedure, the Gypsum 3 which is an obstacle departure for runway 25. APG will prepare the runway analysis using this flight track for determining the takeoff weights and in addition to presenting the analysis to the pilot a textual description is also included. Note that the runway 25 now has a suffix of DP denoting that it's a departure procedure and that it follows the gypsum procedure as published. Let's look at an additional benefit of using a runway analysis and that is that the use of a runway analysis allows the operator to depart at lower than standard takeoff weather minimums. Referring to the Air Transportation Inspector's Handbook 8400.10, POIs shall not authorize operators who do not prepare an airport analysis and perform obstacle climb computations to use lower than standard takeoff minimums. Flight Standards has given a ruling stating that approval is not required, but instead the POI gives acceptance of the process that the operator uses. Let's look at an additional benefit of using a runway analysis. A runway analysis accounts for the loss of climb due to turning or gradient loss in a turn. Remember that when an aircraft enters a turn, its climb performance or climb capability is degraded. All things being equal, for the same distance being flown, an aircraft in a climbing turn will be at a lower altitude than the same aircraft in a wings level climb. In addition, the longer the aircraft remains in a turn, 
the greater the difference between its altitude and that of the same aircraft in a wings level climb. Runway analyses account for this effect, however gradient calculators do not. Before looking at an example of this effect, let's look at the FAA's view on gradient loss in a turn. The Air Transportation Inspector's Handbook 8400.10 states that when a turn is used, the rate of climb or gradient must be reduced by the increment of climb performance lost. Additionally, Advisory Circular 120-91 has similar requirements. Now let's look at an example of a departure procedure that has a large amount of turning prior to crossing critical terrain. Eagle, Colorado, Gypsum 3 departure, runway 25, has a large amount of maneuvering starting from the runway end and then proceeding northwestbound. Remember that the effect of the loss of climb performance is cumulative and that by the time the aircraft reaches approximately where the red arrow is pointing, there has been a substantial degradation in its climb capability. Let's now overlay this procedure on a topographical chart. The critical terrain which limits the takeoff weight of most all aircraft departing runway 25 out of Eagle is noted by the red arrow. Due to the large amount of maneuvering required from liftoff to this point and recognizing that the effect of loss of climb capability is cumulative, aircraft crossing this ridgeline will be more than 120 feet closer to the ground than had they been in a wings level climb for the same distance flown. The effect of gradient loss due to a turn is taken into account on all APG prepared departure procedures. In conclusion, a runway analysis is a thorough analysis of the runway and obstacles in the departure corridor and that a runway analysis can improve the margin of safety along with increasing payload by use of engine out departure procedures and the use of the 80 percent landing rule. Runway analysis is compliant with FAR 135, 121, 91 and complies with Advisory Circular 120-91. Thank you for your attention to our presentation. We hope that you have found it useful and interesting. Should you have any questions, please contact us at the following. Thank you.